go ahead and get started here. I said it already to most of you, if I missed you, happy Resurrection Day to you. And as I mentioned last week, if you were here, bear with me a moment, I reminded us that most of our holidays that are on our calendars basically have pagan sources or pagan influences, and I don't think you'll get much um, argument about that. And Easter, um, it's really no exception. It's not an exception. It seems that the exact origins of Easter are really unknown. As you study this and you go research it, um, it goes all the way back to, some people take it back to Genesis and do some things there, and some people there that were um, tied to the Tower of Babel, and then all over the world there are different cultures that have different um, beliefs about this thing, Easter. And basically, the, the name Easter, no matter what language it is, is tied to a goddess or a, a lady who um, was believed to give life. And it's also tied to the seasons, spring coming and things coming back to life and all of that. But it really had very little, if anything, to do with Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And so we just want to make sure that you know that and, and that we keep those things before you. You don't have to really be too smart if you really think this thing out. You've got eggs, you've got rabbits, you've got candy, you've got new clothes, uh, you've got the showing off of the new clothes. Um, we've got all of these things, but if you think about it logically, how does that tie to Yahweh? It really doesn't, okay? But we're not going to um, tell anybody um, a bunch of negative things or come down on anybody. We just want to make sure that you understand what's really going on in the culture, okay? And this has been going on for a long time, hasn't it? But it basically probably doesn't have anything whatsoever to do with the resurrection of Christ. But Christians have kind of attached that to this day. And so that's what it's called, the resurrection day, for many of us. As I mentioned um, last week, as we looked at Palm Sunday, and we kind of brought some of the same information to you, as Christians, we want to really have it where every day of the week is a day that we honor God. Okay, every day of the week, no matter what day it is, we want to honor God and we want to spread his fame and we want to spread his name every day of the week. And that's really our job as Christians. Okay. And so I want to encourage each one of us today, including myself, I want to encourage us all to honor Yahweh, honor the triune God today in all that you say and do, no matter where you find yourself, honor him today. Okay, let's honor him. So, we've set aside this day to remember one of the most important facts about the Christian faith, and that is basically that Jesus is alive. We serve a risen Savior, a, a living Savior. He put it all together for us, and if we really understand what he did at Calvary, we should not fear death. Should not fear death at all. If we really understand what Jesus did at Calvary, we should be looking forward to transitioning to be in his presence. And we can only imagine what that's like. We should be looking forward to transitioning from this life of faith and not seeing him to actually seeing him face to face, okay? So that's what this is all about. And so we're looking forward to that as we really understand the word of God. Again, we can only imagine what it's really going to be like. So today our sermon, of course, is focused on the resurrection. And so what I'd like to do is what I always do each Sunday. I want us to take a, just a moment to have a word of prayer. And I want you to pray for yourself, and specifically, that God will speak to you today. You need a word from God today. Ask God to speak to you today through the message, no matter where you find yourself, no matter what's going on in your life. God sees you, and God wants to give you a word. And so I ask you to pray for yourself that God will speak to you. Pray for yourself that you will hear what God has to say. And then pray for me that nothing up here hinders you from getting that word. Okay? So let's do that silently, and then I'll open us in silent prayer. Well, Father, we come before you again, and we thank you again for hearing our prayers. And Father, just uh, short and sweet and to the point, we are just asking you to speak to each and every one of us today, that we would get that word from you. And Father, we pray as we talk about resurrection, that you will use this for your glory and honor, and that you will use it to enhance our relationship with you, to help us to have a proper view of you and a proper view of ourselves, and then teach us how to live. And so, Father, we pray that you'll just um, do above and beyond what we could ever ask or think. You have told us you're able to do that and you're willing, and so we trust you to do just that. In Christ's name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. If you'll stand at this time, we're going to have a scripture reading this morning. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
and it's going to be verses 20 through 28. And what we've looked at earlier, as we called to worship, we had Matthew chapter 28, and we actually took you back to the resurrection of Jesus. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there's going to be a little talk about the order of resurrections. God has a plan for resurrections. He has an order for them. And then he talks about how the enemies of God are going to be eliminated in this particular passage that's tied to resurrection. And then how that things eventually will be administered by the triune God. And it's tied to resurrection as well. So we're going to read this together. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 20. And as soon as it goes up on the screen there, we will read it. Okay, let's read it together. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. Excuse me. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Thank you. Resurrection. Today I want to come at you in a different way. What is this resurrection thing all about? I want to ask some, some very pertinent questions. What does resurrection have to do with my life? Okay, what does resurrection have to do with my life? Why should I be focused on resurrection today? As a matter of fact, why should I be focused on resurrection on any day? Okay, why should I be focused on this thing called resurrection? Well, saints, we got to get this and we, we really don't get it. And I hope today we'll get a little closer to getting it. Resurrection is big. Resurrection is big. And I want to take you back. We've talked about Resurrection in Matthew 28, what actually happened that day. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we talk about resurrection, and what's going to happen in the future. And so what I want to do now is just kind of take you back in the past a little bit and show you some things about resurrection from the past. It all goes back to this, and I need you to really stay with me here. It all goes back to this, something you already know. There is an ongoing battle going on in the universe an ongoing battle going on in the universe all the time. And this battle is between Yahweh, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and all the other gods. This battle is between Yahweh, who is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and all the other gods. And so these gods that we're talking about, that's how God talks about them, and I'm gonna bring that to you a little bit later. But there's a battle going on, and these gods can be defined as spiritual beings who are fighting against God, okay? And they are created beings, they are spiritual beings, and they are fighting against God. There is a battle that has been going on for a long time between Yahweh and these other gods. There has been a lot going on, and it's going to continue to go on with these invisible um, beings. And what I need you to understand is these invisible beings or gods that I'm talking to you about right now, um, they are fighting against Yahweh by being the power source behind what are called false religions. Okay, stay with me now. Stay with me. These beings, these other gods, are the power source by, um, behind false religions. So any religion, as we use that term, that is going on on our planet that is not tied to Yahweh is a false religion and it has a power source behind it. It has a being behind it. Okay, are you staying with me? This is going to be a little bit different today. Stay in here with me now. They are fighting against Yahweh. You have to understand that sometimes when we say this word idol and you read the word idol in your Bible, you're thinking of a stone or a monument. You're thinking of something that you can look at that has no power. You're looking at a piano and that can be an idol. But you have to understand that was not the mindset of the people during those times. 
They knew that that was just a stone. They knew that was just a piece of wood as well. But what they knew was that these beings that are behind the religion need something to come and work through. And so when they had this idol, it was just a place where they could kind of meet the living being. Are you seeing that? So they didn't just see it as a rock. That's dumb. They're not that dumb. But they saw it as this is a place where I can come meet. This is a place where we can meet with this being. And this being shows his life okay to us through these idols so it was never about praying to a rock they were always praying to the power behind the rock are, are you following that are you following me staying with me now and so as we get into this I'm gonna you know bring you some more information here I just want to make sure you're grabbing this so I thought about it how can I communicate this to you this is the way I can communicate this to you the Ten Commandments the people of God were enslaved in Egypt. Do you remember that? Okay, and when I said Ten Commandments, that was kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing because maybe if you don't know your Bible, you saw the movie. You know, people get their theology from movies. But what I'm talking about is the children of Israel being in bondage in Egypt. Do you remember that? Let my people go. Are you guys following me there? And so as we, we get into this, I want you to remember this because this is gonna make some things clear for you. In that particular battle on the physical realm, there were two men who were against each other. Do you know who they were? Can you tell me? Talk to me. Pharaoh and Moses were against each other, okay? Now, there were two um, gods behind these two men, okay? The god that was behind Moses' name is Yahweh, okay? And that's kind of unfair. But Pharaoh had some gods behind him, and if you remember the text, he had at least 10 gods behind him. He had 10 gods behind him. See, this is what I want you to get, get you to see there. You don't have any problem accepting Yahweh behind Moses, but you're gonna go on like this when I say, no, there were gods as God called them because he judged them behind Pharaoh as well. But see, Pharaoh had 10 gods behind him. Stay with me now, okay? So, they all have power here. Do you remember when Moses was in front of Pharaoh and he threw down his rod? What happened to his rod? Okay, then what did the men of Pharaoh's group do with their rods? Do you see power there? Do you see power here? Their rods turned into snakes also. And then what happened to show superiority? Moses' the snake ate the others. There, there's the, and the whole thing is about who is the superior God, who is the stronger God. That was the first lesson, but if we don't get that and we don't grab it, we're asleep, okay? So Yahweh's snake ate the other snakes. Yahweh's snake was supreme. The snake was representing God's power and who he was. He was above all from the very beginning. But they didn't get that because God wanted to show out. He wanted to show out. He didn't just want to show some snakes. He had a whole lot to do. So there's 10 gods, at least behind Pharaoh. And let me just name a couple things out here. One of his gods' name was Seth, okay? He was the protector of crops. Do you remember that? Did God not destroy all of their crops? Okay, so he knocked Seth out, okay? Then there was this god called Nut or Newt, and this is the sky goddess, okay? God did some things there. Um, one time it was so dark they could not even see the sky, okay? We're going on here, stay with me. Isis, you probably have heard that name before, the goddess of life. Okay, did you see, if you remember the story, God basically took all the life out of Egypt by the time he was done. Then we have uh, this one, you familiar with the god Ra? Yeah. Okay, that's the sun god, Ra, right? Ra, okay? God made it so dark in Egypt, our Bible says you could feel the darkness. You could feel the darkness, it was like, it was that dark. Are you understanding, are you grasping here? There's a war between the gods and Egypt is an illustration of God showing up, Yahweh, gotta go by the name. Who is the name of this God? Yahweh is showing up and he is showing out and he is showing himself superior to all gods. Your name is Ra, you got the sun, I'm gonna make it so dark nobody can see. Then God did something so fantastic, it was dark in Egypt but light where his people were, Goshen. 
Who's superior? I am. Your God, Ra, is not showing up for you. Okay? And then uh, Osiris. Osiris. He's kind of big. He's kind of big. Osiris, you've heard that. He's the giver of life. He's the giver of life. So what did God do? God showed up and showed out, and he really showed out when it came to Osiris because he says, I'm going to kill the firstborn of everybody in Egypt, and you ask Osiris to show up, and you pray to him and see if he will resurrect your dead. Osiris couldn't do a thing. Let my people go. That was the final straw. Death came in the house. There was nothing anybody could do not even Osiris. Are you following me, folks? Yeah. Now, this is very relevant to your life. I'm not going to touch on it. I'm on a short, short leash today. I'm on a short leash. But just to give you something to think about, these guys are alive and well still. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Old school, old school, you know, old school. Um, they're alive and well. Some of our secret societies have an unholy trinity, Osiris, Baal, and Yahweh. And we're talking about Freemasonry, okay? Are you following me? Some of these things go down the street. Now, we've got some of these right here on Colfax. Some of the names of these shops are the names of these gods. Are you following that? They're still alive and well. And we as Christians, if we're sleeping, we're not paying attention, we're into this stuff and we're involved in it. And we don't realize what we're involved in. Amen, somebody. So today we're talking about resurrection. I just want you to, to understand, they had a, a god of the Nile. Do you remember God made the Nile bleed? Are you following that? Then they had a God that they, they had a big idol that he came through a, fo a, a frog's image, you know, a, a big frog. God said, let me show that God. I'm going to show out with that too. You want frogs? Here's all the frogs you can get, you know. Could you imagine laying in your bed and a wet frog is rubbing up against you? Something like that. So God took care of the, the God of the frogs. You like flies? Oh, we're going to have flies everywhere. God showed up. All of these were gods. Are you hearing what I'm saying, folks? And Yahweh is trying to show everybody in, the, in that time and today, I am the one true God. I'm the winner of the fight. Let's fight. I am the winner of this fight. Then what about the bulls? Okay, the whole thing there. They had a whole thing with their cattle. Cattle were sacred and all of that. God put something on all of their cattle. Their cattle died too. Okay, so God dealt with every God that was there. This thing was 10 to 1 and Yahweh still beat every God was, that was there. He said, I am going to show people who I am, but I'm also going to bring judgment on these gods. There are living beings behind this idolatry, behind these religions, behind these false things. There are living beings, and God calls them gods, and today I'm going to call them gods. He calls them gods himself. I'm bringing judgment on all of the gods of Egypt. Okay? So I hope that helps you understand it just a little bit, really, a little bit better. The book of Exodus at the beginning is really a, a picture of a heavyweight fight between the gods. And so what I want to make sure you understand, there was no doubt about who the most high God is. See, Yahweh is the most high God. He's in a class all by himself. He is the most high. He is God Almighty, El Shaddai. He's in a class all by himself. And every so often, God has to remind us of who is in his class. Nobody but him. And so by the time we left Egypt, everybody understood. They're giving their jewelry away, giving everything they have. Get out of here so he doesn't do anything else. We understand. Some people said, forget that. I'm joining them. Theirs is the real God. And so a multitude went out with them because they were convinced Yahweh was the true God. Okay? So it's Resurrection Sunday. Ron, where are you going? How do you, how do you get there? Where are you going? Oh, I got it. I got it. Stay with me. The final knockout punch in Egypt was around death and res resurrection. It was about death and resurrection. God basically said some things. You know, he said, I'm coming in to take life and nobody's going to be able to stop me. And nobody is going to be resurrecting anybody either. I'm coming in to show who I am. Okay. And so there was a death there. It centered on death and resurrection. Isaiah 43, 11 says this, I, even I, am the Lord. There is no Savior besides me. 
Okay? There is no deliverer besides me. God is saying, I'm the one that delivers. Nobody can deliver anybody out of God's hands if God wants them in the hand. Are you saying? We can't hide from God. We can't run from God. We can't box from God. You know, box God. We can't do any of that. No, no. God is gracious and slow to mercy. Okay? I mean, plenteous in mercy and slow to anger, excuse me. And so sometimes we think that because we don't see anything happening, that God is some weak grandpa that doesn't know how to operate a cell phone. No, this is not Yahweh. This is not Yahweh. You need to get the God of the Bible in our minds, okay? He says, I am the Lord. There's no savior besides me. I'm the one who delivers. I'm the one that rescues. I'm the one that saves. Isaiah 43, 13 says, even from eternity, I am he. There is none who can deliver out of my hand. There's none who can deliver out of my hand. And I act... And who can reverse it? The text expects a no one answer. Okay? Psalm 66, 9 says this, and we need to keep this in mind. It is God that keeps you in the land of the living. It is God that keeps you in the land of the living. You know, you can do your exercise, you can do your diet and all that. That's all good. It's all good. Take care of yourself. But it is God that is keeping you in the land of the living. And if he decides that you're no longer to be in the land of the living, you are no longer going to be in the land of the living. And there ain't going to be anybody to stop that or ask any questions. He is almighty God. So you remember what happened. God defeated every God they believed in. And then he said, Moses, get things in order. I'm going to take some life, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. This game is over. Okay, this is over. I'm through playing now. I need to end this. I got some other things to do. I'm getting my people out. They're coming out today because I'm getting ready to drop death in the house. Okay? So Yahweh took the life of every firstborn under, who wasn't under that protection. He says, if you want to live, you better get, get your little blood. And you better do some painting. Do some painting, okay? Do some painting, because if I don't see that blood paint when I pass over, and he said, I, when I pass over, if there's a firstborn in there, they're going to die. And so he says, Moses, get everybody together, tell them what's going on. This blood was making a statement on your door. Yahweh's my God. Yahweh's my protector, okay? So then God took life. You know the story. The firstborn, they died. Get these people out of here, okay? And so they called out to their God, Osiris. He could do nothing. They called out to Ra. He could do nothing. Nobody could do anything because there was no God there able to resurrect the dead. None. Not one. All those people died. No one there could resurrect the dead. And why? Because there is no God in Yahweh's class. There's no God in Yahweh's class. Exodus 15, 3 says the Lord is, the, it says Yahweh is a warrior. And it says, make sure you know who you're talking about. Yahweh is his name. He's the warrior. Exodus 15, 3. So bringing it down where you're living, stay here with me. The war between God and these other gods continues. It's happening right now as you're sitting here in this sanctuary. It's happening right now. And Yahweh is still Yahweh. He hasn't changed, changed in who he is and in his character. He's always on a rescue mission. He's always going to be the savior and the deliverer. John 3, 16, you remember it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Yeah. Yahweh's always on the rescue mission, always the deliverer, always the rescuer. And so he's out to rescue those who will believe in his son. He sent his son on a mission. Okay, and that mission was to make everybody here savable, to make everybody here savable. It does not mean that we are saved, but Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension makes us savable. There's an option to get saved or not. Okay, so we need to be um, keeping these things in mind and really thinking about this, that God's on a rescue mission. He's still on a rescue mission. There's still a lot of this warring going on. And so there's a war of the gods going on. And you're not neutral. You're not neutral. You're serving somebody. Whether you know it or not, you're serving somebody. And perhaps you know the name of the God that you're serving. But we're all serving somebody. So God is inviting us to relationship with the one true God. 
God is not saying there aren't other gods out there. He's saying, no, I'm inviting you into a relationship with Yahweh. Okay? The creator of the heavens and the earth. The powerful God. Yahweh is his name. Christ came. He died. He was buried. And he rose again for our sins. And so as we get into it, we go back to Egypt. And so that battle ended because none of those gods were able to raise the dead. Okay? None of them were able to raise the dead, and that's how that battle ended. There's a person who also has a name. He has a lot of names. One of them is deceiver, liar, thief. Um, this individual I'm talking about, the Bible says he can even appear as an angel of light. He can get you convinced that you're on the right track. You're actually um, with the right God. Okay, so in our text that we're thinking about in the Gospels, he's called Satan, okay? And he showed up personally on another mission. He wanted to destroy Christ's mission. He wanted to get in there and bring some interference so God could not rescue us and get this relationship going with us. So he came himself, okay? He didn't send a private, he came himself. And when Christ was out in the wilderness, his first tactic was to do something that usually works for him. Try to talk somebody into leaving God out. Try to talk somebody into doing it their way instead of God's way. And he was even trying to talk Christ into doing it his way. Hey, Satan said, do it my way. God has these kingdoms set up for you. I'll just give them to you. You don't have to do what God is saying. So that's how he works. He's always trying to get you and I to turn against God. Get us suspicious of God. Think negative things about God. God doesn't love you. God doesn't like you. He's weak. He's old. He's not relevant. These other gods are going to do you better. Are you following me? He, they're going to do you better. So he tried that on Christ, but it didn't work. Christ just quoted scripture. Oh, no, I know what the truth is. That's not going to work, okay? He tries to divide and conquer, okay? Divide you away from God. That's what he tries to do, divide you away from God. He tries to divide us away from each other. That's the tactic he's always used. Try to divide you in your marriage, divide you in your family, divide you in your church. He's always trying to do that. Turn you against somebody, bring some tension so you go this way. He's always doing that, but it didn't work with Christ. Christ is not going to leave. He's not going to leave the Father. He's gonna do what the Father wants him to do, okay? And so he tried that. So then what he did is, um, he said, well, I think I know what I'll do. I'm going to put him to death. I'm going to put him to death. Death sure did end the game in Egypt. I'm going to come and I'm going to do what God did. I'm going to bring death in the house. If I bring death in the house, that sure should end things, shouldn't it? So the war of the universe doesn't stop. It just changes appearance or tactics, okay? So then this time Satan wants to win. And so again, Yahweh shows his superiority by showing that he creates life, he takes life, and he resurrects life. So Satan said, hey, we can do all that we can. Let's, let's get this. He worked hard. When he heard Christ say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, I got it. I, I got this thing is over. Oh, God, into your hand I commit my spirit. Oh, I got him now. This thing is over. I have conquered here. Death is in the house. But folks, we don't get it. This God, Yahweh, he never loses. No matter how bleak it looks, no matter how dark it looks, no matter how much you're thinking, oh no, all is lost, Yahweh has never lost a battle. He's in a class all by himself. He is the most high God. He's never lost a battle. And even when it looks like everything is going against him and going Satan's way, God even uses that for his glory and honor. Because see, you didn't really, we, we, we didn't really understand, Satan didn't even really understand the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ set everybody free and made them savable. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things like you shot yourself in the foot, you think you're so smart, but you played right into Yahweh's hands. You played right into Yahweh's hands. There's a writer by the name of Michael Heiser, and uh, he talks about, you know, We've always struggled and we look for this death, burial, and resurrection in the Old Testament. And you know, there's, there's, there's pictures of a suffering servant, but you don't ever get a bunch of details in one place. All through your Old Testament, you get a little something over here about um, there's going to be somebody in Genesis 3.15 that's going to come and fix some things. And you get a suffering servant over here and they pierced him whom they, 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 they pierced this person and you get a little bit about crucifixion. 
but you never get a treatise of this God, this Jesus is going to come, die, bury, and rise again, and set everybody free and make them savable and do all this and all this information. It's just scattered and just dispersed. And you know, I don't know about you, but I've always kind of wrestled with that because you know you really don't get a clear-cut definition of the death, burial, and resurrection in the Old Testament. You just get little glimpses, a little bit here, a little bit there. It's there, but it's not there where you could just read it and go, ooh, when Christ comes, everything's gonna be all right. Well, I'm cutting it very short, but Michael Heiser gives me something to really think about because what he said is, God knew what he was doing, Satan didn't know what he was doing, and he didn't put too much information there so Satan would be able to figure out what he was doing. So when he crucified Christ, he did exactly what God intended, but had he known, he wouldn't have done that. Because you see, when Jesus Christ was resurrected, you were potentially set free if you'd like to have a relationship with him. Hallelujah. Satan wanted everybody to stay in slavery to him. Stay afraid of death. Stay in here. Do this. You can't do it. You're only human. I'm going to be like this the rest of my life. That's what he wanted. But Christ set us free. Hallelujah. So what Michael Heiser is saying is God is so smart. He didn't put it all in one place because these other gods might have figured it out and then they would have messed up God's plan. They thought they were so smart, Satan comes himself, crucifies God, and plays right into God's plans. So, they thought they'd killed him, it's all over. No, he raises his son from the dead. Resurrection is so very important. This time in Egypt, this time in the war, God does the reverse. You killed him and thought it was over, you don't know, I, the triune God, I'm gonna raise Christ from the dead. And when Christ was raised from the dead, you got stamped to your account. Sins paid for, freedom in life, everything, a victorious Christian life, a, a life that God calls you to on a, so much of a higher standard. All of that happened the moment Christ rose from the dead. All of that happened for everybody who believes in him. All of that happened. It was a big thing, very smart of God. Not only is Yahweh smart, I mean powerful, he's smart too. He didn't have to even use his power. Satan kind of did, did it for him. Do you see? Did it for them. Did it for him, excuse me. God thinks very highly of the resurrection today. You talk about the miracles of Egypt. You talk about the war of the gods. It was 10 to 1, he took them all out. Then they left, God parts the Red Sea, they go through on dry land, the Egyptians are drowned in the sea. That's big time. That's big time. In recent years, they're still finding Egyptian hardware in the sea, still. That's impressive. But you know, in God's eyes, he says, my children, what really impresses me the most is the power it took to raise my son from the dead. All those things were impressive, but it took power to raise my son from the dead. And you need to understand, we don't have it all down, and I want to be careful not to speculate. But those other gods did not want to see Christ rise from the dead. They, did, they didn't want to see that at all. They didn't want to see it at all. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read some scriptures. They'll be on your screen. We're going to read them together, verse 20, verses 18 through 23. And Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 23 is basically saying this. I want you guys to wake up. You need to be enlightened about what really happened there, what really, what really happened. And then he talks about, and that took power. And then he's saying, and Christians need to wake up and understand on resurrection day that God is saying that power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, lives in you. And we're weak and feeble and can't, you know, ah, no, no, that's not, no, no. There's something wrong here, okay? And so we need, to, we need to really find out who we really are. It starts talking about Christ was raised to this place of exaltation at God's right hand. Okay, it talks about all that. There's a possibility that they were trying to keep him from, from getting up there. So God still raised him up. God did a whole bunch. It took power to resurrect the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's read verses 18 through 23 together. And um, let's go ahead and start. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. Read this together with me. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? 
These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. God showed his power. His son was resurrected above everything and everyone visible. Okay, listen, saints. He was resurrected. He is above everything and everyone who is visible. And the text is saying this. He was resurrected and he's above everything and everyone who is invisible. Okay, and then if you look real closely there in verse 21, these invisible beings have rank and power, rule and authority, powers and dominions. They have that. And so he's above all of that. God is trying to get you to understand you serve Yahweh, Christ, his son. Um, this is the ultimate in power. This is the ultimate in rank here. There is no one above the triune God. No one at all. Resurrection is everything. Okay. All that power is at the disposal of a Christian. I want to ask, are we really experiencing that power? Are we really experiencing it, saints? Okay, the resurrection is everything. It's far above an Estar goddess or whatever you might want to call her. It's so much further above rabbits and Easter bunnies and Easter eggs and buying new clothes and all that. The resurrection is so far above all of that, we can't even have it in the same Discussion, okay? It shouldn't even be in the same discussion. The resurrection shows, folks, how gossip, excuse me, how awesome God is, okay? How awesome God is. This Yahweh, okay? And this same Yahweh, the same awesome God, is inviting you into relationship with Him. He's inviting you into relationship with Him. Do you have a relationship? Do you have a relationship? Don't serve other gods. Don't serve other gods. I'm here just, just asking, don't serve other gods. Don't be loyal to other gods. Are, are you following me? Folks, we, we've got to wake up. We've got to pay attention. We're asleep in a lot of these areas. We're serving other gods and we're following people who are serving other gods. Okay, you see what I'm saying? We're, we're, we're doing that and so we, we need to really wake up. It's just like back in Egypt. You got to ask yourself, which god are you serving? Are you serving Yahweh? Are you serving Ra? Are you serving Isis? Who are you serving? But you got to pay attention. The moment you go out of this church today and you drive down the street, there's going to be a shop that a, 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 another God owns. Okay? Some of us, we talk about masonry, all that kind of stuff. Goes clear back to Nimrod, all the way back to the Tower of Babel. We got stuff like that. We got all of those things going on. Beyonce, and, and you know, she just says that when she goes out to do a concert, she just disappears, something else takes over, and then it comes back, she comes back after the concert is over. We're paying money, we're doing all of that, we're supporting other gods, we're supporting others who have sold themselves to these other gods, and we're supporting them, and we don't, we, we, we're kind of asleep. Are, are you seeing what I'm saying? I don't mean to be legalistic, I don't mean to be, you know, but, but we're, we're kind of asleep, we're serving other gods, and we don't even know it, and then we want to bring it in the church too, and keep doing it in the church. Are you following that? Um, Mason you know, some of the finest, well, should I say, some of the most known pastors are in masonry. Especially in our community. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Osiris, Baal, Nimrod, all that's tied to masonry. And we're in masonry, and we're high-ranking. Secret societies. You need to check everything that you're involved in what is it really about and what are the roots of it? We're doing a lot of things that we don't know we're doing. Do you see what I'm saying? And guys, the holidays, you need to be praying on all the holidays. What, what do they really mean? What is the real substance of them? What were they intended to do? And here's a big one. I hope you like the language. What God are they serving? What God are they serving? So in closing, don't serve other gods. Don't be loyal to other gods. Be loyal to Yahweh. Be loyal to Yahweh and serve Him. So the last thing we want to read today is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. And I'm hoping that as I speak to you and I'm closing, that you have a relationship with Yahweh. 
Okay, I hope that you have a relationship with him, that you know him personally. And if you don't, I want to give you the opportunity to find out how you can get to know him. It's very, very simple. We have to believe what he says. And he has something that he says called the gospel or good news. And the good news is that you can have a relationship with him. The good news is that he's done everything he can do to make you savable. And now you need to take the next step and get saved and receive his gift. Salvation is a gift. It's not something you earn. It's not something you do to get it. You believe the gospel that Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again for your sins. But folks, it's more than just believing the gospel in a sense. What I'm trying to say is you get more. You get God. And so you get God for everyday life. You get God to live out his life through you. You get God to be there with you through all that you're going through. You get God to do what the man we're going to read wrote about. Get your life turned around. God turned Paul's life around. Amen? So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I will go ahead, let's read this together. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. You've just been presented the gospel. Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again for your sins. And if you'd like to start that relationship, it's as simple as believing that. You can express that to God through prayer if you'd like to. But God's saying it's a gift, and uh, he wants to give you the gift. We don't want to make it any harder than it is. We just have to choose with our wills to receive it. For those of you who are saved already, I want to say something here, and I say it um, from the bottom of my heart. And I say it to Ron Fox, first of all, quit thinking so small about God. Quit thinking so small about Yahweh. We are insulting Almighty God with how small we think. I can't, we can't, he can't, I can't get over this, I'm stuck, I've been this way my whole life, nothing's gonna ever change. All of that kind of stuff, when you have Yahweh, that's insulting to Almighty God. We need to let God be who he is. This is Yahweh, the creator of the heavens and the earth, for which there's nothing too hard to do. Yahweh is boxed with every God and one, and so is your and my stuff bigger than all the gods of Egypt? I don't think so. We need to start acting like what God says is true. If Yahweh is Yahweh, he's Almighty God, then we need to start acting like it, and we need to start treating him like it, and we need to start believing what he said and live accordingly. We are living on a, a pauper's level when we are kings and queens in Christ because we don't really believe our God can do anything. Not, what God is that we're believing? We're serving another God. We're not serving Yahweh. Yahweh's not this weak, anemic God that we're serving that can't do anything. I'm stuck, I've got this, I've got that, there's no way out. That's not Yahweh. God, Yahweh parted the Red Sea. He can't give you a way out of your situation. Are you seeing this? We serve Yahweh, the creator of the universe. We need to start thinking like it, and we need to start acting like it. The God we're serving is not Yahweh, because he's surely too small and helpless and weak and old and all that good stuff. Let's serve the God of the Bible. He said, I am a warrior. Yahweh is my name. Is your God a warrior? 
Do you know his name? Do we know him? Let's stop living in unbelief. And here's why. The resurrection happened. There's no one more powerful than Yahweh. Let's stop living in unbelief. Amen? Please hear what I'm saying. I beg of you. We're serving the wrong God. Let's serve Yahweh. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Father, we come and, Lord, if we can, we want to be theologically correct here, Lord, but I'm just talking to you in relationship. Father, please forgive us for treating you like you are one of these small gods. Please forgive us for treating you like you're Ra or Osiris or someone like that that is, is uh, not almighty. Please forgive us for not acknowledging and treating you the way we should, that you are almighty God, the most high God, the one in a class all by himself. We've got a picture of an anemic God, and if we can't do it ourselves, it can't get done, and I'm trapped, and I have to stay here, and, and I, I can't get out, and no one can help me, and we've got all these things, and oh Lord, how heaven must weep. They see you in all your glory and power, and they see the picture we have of you. It's not a true picture. Forgive us for serving other gods other than the Bible. And forgive us today when we've been in situations, Father, where we are, are, are actually serving these other gods. Osiris, Ra, uh, these other gods, Father, we're actually serving them. We are putting money in their pockets, Father. We, we, we even have to mention ancestor worship, which we're not blushing at. That's a, a heavy thing too, Lord. And calling on the dead, stuff that you hate. Um, Father, we ask your forgiveness, we repent. So this resurrection day, Father, give us a fresh picture of the resurrection God. And a summary sentence of today's sermon is that God, Yahweh, resurrected Christ from the dead. There is no other, nobody else in his class. And we get to have relationship with you. Help us to realize who we have relationship with. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your patience with us, your mercy and your kindness. Thank you for saving us. I pray for that person that might not have a relationship with you. I pray they start.